let's sing together. Time and time again, you have proven you 
do just what you say Though the storms may come and the winds may blow I'll remain steadfast And let my heart learn when you speak a word It will come to pass Great is your faithfulness to me Great is your faithfulness to the rising sun to the setting same I will praise your name great is your faithfulness to God from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same, yeah. Your history can prove, oh, there's nothing you can't do, you're faithful and true. And though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come. Amen. It is good to worship him this morning. Let's take the next few moments and greet those around us. Good morning, Harvest Fremont. How we doing? Woo! 
All right, so this morning looks a little different than our usual Sunday mornings. We have a special day, Child Dedication Sunday. And so uh, how exciting that these parents want to express their appreciation to God for the blessing of children through having these kiddos dedicated. How fun is that? But first off, for those of you who don't know me, I, my name's Adam Forbes. I'm the family director here, and I get the honor and privilege of being part of this. Here's a picture of my family up here. It's a humble brag, me smooching on my smoking wife. Got three kids, Hudson, Wesson, and Eliza, seven, six, and four. I am thankful. And uh, last night was my first ever daddy-daughter dance. <sighs> yes, melt your heart. It's awesome. It's awesome. Daughter dads, it's great. But anyways, many more to come. I told her until she gets married, I'll take her to some. And she told me she's never getting married. So I told her, we have a lot of daddy-daughter dances to hit up. <laughs> That's okay. That's all right for now. Anyways, these parents are here to present kids before God, before the church, asking for wisdom in raising and carrying out the God-given responsibilities as parents. And uh, we're thankful for that. Thankful for you guys being here. Everybody here, I believe, is excited for you guys. So... To start off, we have Spencer and India Telcamp dedicating Sterling. He's a whopping four months old. Look at that. We got John Deere going on up there. Woo, already. There's going to be some rivalries here. But we have Schroeder and Megan Vanderhoof with Jasper at 10 months old. We got some serious babies in the house lately. Like, we're going to have another round probably nine months from now, I think, too. So, Raymond and Emily Batma, they have Camden Menno Batma, and he is four months old. Camden, what's up, big man? Yeah. Got two big sisters here up here with you. How you girls doing? You excited to be a big sister? You guys excited? Yeah, that's a yes, I'm sure. <laughs> Christian and Carly Craig, they were so excited that they came last week to dedicate their kids just a week early. They were completely off, but that's all right. Attempt number two, we're here, they're here. So they're dedicating Chloe, three years old, and we have Callum, one and a half, and then we have Cage over here, five months old. Awesome, awesome. Last but not least, we have Spencer and Paige Suchner, and they have Scarlett, who's five months old. Yeah. <laughs> Love the Oz. It's great. Nobody said that from my family. <laughs> Just kidding. Just kidding. So, <laughs> our children are a gift. Amen? Amen. Yes. Uh, Psalm 127 says, Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb, a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a hunter, a warrior, are the children of one's youth. Blessed is the man who fills his quiver. Some of you guys are on a great start to fill in that quiver, all right? But we don't keep our quiver full of arrows and never send them out, right? The Bible called me to leave and cleave to my wife and likewise to her. It says the same for our children. Years later, but it's coming fast, all right? And uh, it's coming faster and faster for me, I know. Proverbs says grandchildren are a crown of the aged and the glory of children is their fathers. How many grandparents are in the house this morning? Amen. What an awesome thing, grandparents. It's great. Proverbs also says gray hair is a crown of glory. And I know Pastor Dan might be bald, but I'm sure there's gray hair that would come up there. And I know his beard is, so. But anyways, our children are also a responsibility, a big one. Deuteronomy says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and all your might. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise. That's a lot. Proverbs 22 says, train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. So what does this mean practically for these families? Love the Lord with all your heart. Be an example to your children. We say here often, more is caught than taught. I know my kids are catching a ton lately. It's crazy. More is caught than taught. Talk about Jesus often. I know we all need him, so we shouldn't be afraid to tell our kids that we need him. Don't be afraid to tell your kids we need Jesus. And just to clarify, before we get into the commitments, child dedication is by no means salvation. 
Romans 10, 9 says, because if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, there's some sounds going on up here, but it's not confessing that Jesus is Lord, right? Someday, Lord willing, it will be. But today, what parents, what you are doing is committing to the following. I will strive to model a Christ-centered home. I will train up and discipline my child or children in the Lord. I will encourage my child to trust Jesus as their personal Savior. If you agree with this, say we do. Okay, I was going to say, I saw Carly over here say, say, shaking her. <laughs> the leader says we do. All right, let's go. The church, we are privileged to be part of this. Galatians calls us to bear one another's burdens. So today, we are committing to the following. We will model love, forgiveness, and grace to our church family and these new families up here. We will pray that these children will trust Jesus as Lord and Savior. If you agree with this, say we do. Amen. I'm going to call some pastors and elders forward at this time to pray over these families. But there's some first-time parents up here. And I would encourage the not-so-first-time parents out here. As you see these families in the hallways, at the coffee shop, at Walmart picking up that another box of 1,000 diapers that goes by in two minutes, you would encourage them. Pray with them as they're raising these littles, depending on caffeine at times, but to, to lean in with these parents and pray with them as they raise these kiddos because it's a hard thing. Families, just want to encourage you, press forward. Get the rest when you can. Lean in on the Lord. Trust in him. All right, I'm going to have Pastor Dan pray for us. If you're comfortable, let's just raise a hand over these families right now. Can we do that? Father God, thank you for today. And Lord, I thank you for the gift of life. Lord, we know that... That doesn't happen without your say-so. Lord, there's a huge responsibility for each one of these parents to train up these children the way they should go. Father, I pray that you continue to give mom and dad the ability to be mom and dad who are showing these children what it means to follow you, not simply just dragging them to church and then going home, but, Father, bringing them to church and then talking to them about what happened at church, what they were able to do and experience together as they corporately gathered with other believers. Father, I pray for the grandparents that, that, that have the opportunity to pour into these little ones. Father, that we also are being a good witness for them. Father, I am thankful for the gift we have in the Bible, in your word that we're able to go to and read. I pray that we read it often, but again, more, Lord, more importantly than anything, that we live it out. Father, I thank you that you are the author and perfecter of faith, and I pray for each one of these little ones. Father, I pray with everything inside of me and every little morsel of faith that I can muster up, that they surrender their precious lives to you, that, Father, they will be able to be with you again in glory one day. Father, again, I just pray for these marriages. Father, I pray that you continue to keep them strong and to keep, keep mom and dad's eyes fixed on you and you alone. Lord, surrendering their will for your will. Lord, we love you. We give you all praise. We give you all honor. We give you all glory. We pray these things in your name, in your mighty name alone. Amen.
today And when it's gone I know we are not You are my hope and stay And when the sea is raging Your spirit is my help You'll fix my eyes on Jesus Christ And I'll say that it is Oh, I know that it is well I'm fighting a battle That you've already won No matter what comes my way You will overcome I don't know what you're doing Mount 
mountain you can move all things are possible and there's no broken body you can raise no so that you can save all things are possible the darkest night you can light it up you can light it And now you're seated Forever on the throne So why should my heart fear What you defeated I will trust in you alone Cause there's no prison Wall you can't break through possible and there's no broken body you can raise no so that you can save all things are possible the darkest night you can light it up you can light it up Come awake in this city Oh God of revival Pour it out, pour it out Every stronghold will crumble I hear the chains hit the ground Oh God of revival Pour it out, pour it out Come awake in your people Come awake in the city Revival, pour it out, pour it out. Every stronghold will crumble. I hear the chains in the ground. Oh, God of revival, pour it out, pour it out. The darkest night, you can light it up. Christ 
alone My hope is found He is my light, my strength, my song This cornerstone, this solid ground Firm through the fiercest drought and storm What heights of love, what depths of peace When fears are still, when striving ceases, My comforter, my all in all Here in the love of Christ I stand of God in helpless babe this gift of love and righteousness scorned by the ones he came to save till on that cross as Jesus died the wrath of God was satisfied By darkness slain, then bursting forth in glorious day. Up from the grave he rose again, and as he stands in victory, sin's curse has lost its real. give him praise this morning. He is worthy of it. Will you pray with me? Father, we lift up your name. We are so thankful for this place and the chance that we get to gather and lift up our voices to you. It is such a privilege. God, we thank you for the fact that in Christ alone, we have salvation. That when you look at us, if we are in Christ, you see your son and you count us righteous. God, we love you, and we are so thankful for your love and your grace. It is in your precious name we pray. Amen. You guys can take a seat.
Well, good morning, Harvest. If you have your Bible, you can turn now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. That is where we are at in the book of 1 Thessalonians. And isn't it so awesome, by the way, just to see so many families bringing kids to church? How cool is that? There's a lot of families in our church that um, are dedicating their children, and some of them are new believers themselves. And so, because they have not had the opportunity to dedicate their baby to the Lord, they're dedicating their children, which is so awesome. And so if you're a parent bringing kids to church faithfully, thank you for modeling faithfulness to your children. We want to see the next generation leading in the church and running after the things of God. And so you start by modeling that in your home. Thank you, parents that are faithful in that. We're going to dive into 1 Thessalonians 4 today, and we're going to be looking at verse 13 and if you've not been with us the last few months, we're going verse by verse through the book of 1 Thessalonians. And today we are in a passage that is one of my most favorite passages in the Bible. I start reading it and I get teary-eyed. God has used it in my life so much. I've, I preach this almost at every funeral I have the opportunity to preach at. And this passage is rich. And so I have the pleasure of bringing to you 1 Thessalonians 14, which deals with The perspective of heaven. Do you have questions about heaven? A lot of people have questions about heaven. One of the questions is, do I even want to go to heaven? The great philosopher Kenny Chesney has a lot to say about heaven. He says this, everybody want to go to heaven, have a mansion high above the clouds. Everybody want to go to heaven, but nobody want to go now. I think Kenny Chesney's wrong. Some people ask this question, not do I want to go, but who goes? Do I get to go to heaven? And there's a lot of people that have their opinion on it. ABC News did an article on the elbow room that we'll find in heaven and did a survey of 6,000 people. And at the end of the survey, it was estimated that 75% of those people think that for sure they're going to heaven. These are Americans. Another 14% of Americans don't think they're going to heaven, or they're not quite sure. I mean, maybe I'll go, but just barely. You know, I mean, there's a lot of other better people than me, like 75% of the other people in the world are better than me. So I don't know if I'm going. And then 10% of people don't believe in heaven at all. The vast majority of Americans believe that if there is a heaven, surely they get to go there. Most Americans believe they go to heaven. But what does the Bible say? Because a survey matters little A country song matters little. What does the Bible say? Would you look with me at verse 13 of chapter 4? We do not want you to be uninformed. God doesn't want you to be confused about heaven. He wants you to be fully informed. Brothers, about those who are asleep, that you do not grieve as others who do not have hope. If you have a pen, would you circle those two words for me? Brother and other. What God highlights is a passage of scripture and says this matters to you totally differently based on this one word, are you a brother or another? Verse 14. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so, through Jesus, it's always through Jesus, God will bring, that's a promise, with him, those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you, By a word from the Lord. This is not Pastor Eric's word. This is not your spouse's word. This is not an important person's opinion. This is God's word for you. It says this. By a word from the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those that fall asleep. So there are some that fall asleep when the Lord returns. They've already passed. And there are some that are alive. And those that fall asleep will go first. Verse 16. The Lord will descend from heaven with a cry of a command and with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with him in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. And God's people said, Amen. Verse 18, therefore, what do we do with this word from the Lord, this prophecy from the Lord? What do we do with it? We encourage one another. 
with these words. Here's the big question today. Am I a brother or another? Am I in the family of God or am I not in the family of God? My prayer for you today is that if you are not in the family of God, you would join the family of God. Three individuals this morning in the first service became believers today. They put their faith in Jesus this morning. And if you are not in the family, we want you to be in the family today. And so if you already are in the family, my hope for you in this text is that you will understand what God has to say about heaven more clearly, that it would encourage you and fortify you in the faith. Whitney, Sarek, and Laura were friends. They went to Taylor University together. And they both volunteered to host a banquet at one of the campuses for their college. And so they loaded up in a van with nine individuals And they drove to a banquet and they served people there and they had fun and they went to get pizza on their way home back to Taylor University. And the nine of them in the van, unfortunately, were hit by a semi-driver who had fallen asleep at the wheel. And in the accident of the nine students, five passed away and four lived. And Whitney was one of the ones that lived and Laura died. The two girls looked very similar. So you might have heard their story from the book Mistaken Identity. The two girls looked similar. They were the same height, the same color hair, had the same facial features, went to the same school. And when Whitney was found on the ground because she was cast out of the van still living, there was Laura's purse sitting next to her. And so the paramedics took her to a hospital and they just assumed it was Laura as they handed in her ID. And for five weeks, Whitney was mentally impaired And her face was swollen and her family was by her side as she slowly regained consciousness. And the family sat with her and they prayed with her and they spent time seeing her slowly rehabilitated. But her supposed sister had some concerns because when she saw her teeth, she noticed they were a different shape of her sister's. And so quietly, when she had opportunity, she started to ask Whitney, Whitney, what's your parents' names? She said, Noel and Colleen. She said, what's, what's my name? She says, I don't know. And then after a little time, they realized that they had the wrong girl in the hospital and they needed to prepare for a funeral. Their daughter, Laura, had died. See, here's the truth. There's many Americans, many people in the world that believe they're part of the family of God. They've checked the box that says Christian. They say that they're going to heaven, but are they in the family? That's what matters to God. And God says it this way in 2 Timothy 2.19. There's a firm foundation that stands. The Lord knows who is his. The Lord knows his family. He's not mentally impaired. He isn't going to be confused. You don't get to sneak up on him. He knows if you're in the family or not in the family. It says this in Matthew 7 verse 13. Enter the narrow gate. The gate is wide and the way is easy that leads to destruction. And those who enter by it are many, many people. We're talking the majority of people. Do not go the narrow way, the narrow gate. The gate is narrow and the way is hard that leads to life. And those that find it are few. So the majority claim what God does not. God says, my family is few. Many claim to be part of God's family. Many claim the title of Christian, but are you a brother or are you another? It's the greatest question that you and I can ask. And this fully confronts modern Christianity today. I mean, there's this uprising of what's called Christian pluralism in our culture. It's this idea that there are plural roads, many roads that lead to heaven. And as long as you have a few nuggets of Christianity in your back pocket, It doesn't really matter what you believe as long as you're kind of a religious or a spiritual person and you believe in God. And as long as you have a few of the nuggets, you're good and you can piece me out together and you are certainly going to heaven. It's called Christian pluralism. There's also Christian universalism. God universally will save all mankind so it doesn't even really matter. And there's been preachers like Rob Bell and many others that just preach that God is too loving to really send us to hell. I mean, he claims that Some will go to hell if they don't believe in him, but he wouldn't really do that. And so there's this 
there's this watered-down version of what we truly know as the gospel. Jesus says it this clear. You're a brother or another. The way is narrow that leads to heaven. Are you family? Are you family? If you are not family, can I just tell you, I've been praying all week that you would join the family, that you would join the three others, that join the family, that you would jump in and become a brother. And you can go to church, but that doesn't make you family. You can say you believe in Jesus, but that doesn't necessarily make you family. Are you confident in your standing before God? He is coming back. It is prophesied. It will happen. It's a promise. We've seen three promises in this text and six prophecies, which we'll get to. It is going to happen. Are you ready? Are you ready? So what makes us a family? Well, here's the first thing Scripture teaches us today. Number one, we must believe in the resurrection. A family member believes in the resurrection. Believing in God is good. But the devils believe and they're pretty scared and they tremble because they don't have what we have, saving knowledge of Jesus. They are not in the family. What is required to be part of the family? You must believe in the resurrection. And the Bible points out a twofold understanding of the resurrection. Here's the first part. It's found in verse 14. Since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, we must believe that Jesus was resurrected. This is so important in our modern culture because often Jesus is demoted to the standing of important religious person and good individual, and he is much more than that. There are many religious leaders throughout world history. There's been Russell, there's been Mohammed, there's been Buddha, there's been Gandhi, there's been Tom Cruise. Many religious leaders, they have all one thing in common. They will die. They will die. There's been really, really good people throughout world history. St. John, Mother Mary, the mother of Jesus. John the Baptist, greatest man to walk the earth. A lot. The, the list keeps going on and on of all the good people. But Jesus is different from all of the good people that have died. And all the people that will die. He died, but he came back to life. Because you see, Jesus... He's not just the way. He's not just the truth. He is himself life. And Jesus rose from the grave because dying for our sins was necessary, but just as necessary was the fact that he must leave the grave, resuscitate himself, bring him back to life so he can bring you and I life. Do you believe in the resurrection? What it requires is for you to take off the veil of he was just a good man, and you must understand that he was a supernatural miracle-making God. Do you believe that Jesus is God? It says this in Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It is required for being saved, for salvation, that you believe in the Godness, the miracle-working power of God at the resurrection. We believe, verse 14, that Jesus died and rose again. Even so, through Jesus, it's always through Jesus, God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. Not only the risen Christ, but the resurrection also entails the rising church. By understanding the resurrection and by believing in it, you not only believe that Christ rose from the grave, but that the church will be risen up to heaven, that the church will be raised. 2 Corinthians 5.8 says this, Yes, we are of good courage, and we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. And so this rising church takes two waves. Here's the first wave. It's those that have passed away already. Do you have a believer, a friend of yours that has already gone? Maybe you have a spouse that has already passed away. Maybe you've had the heart-wrenching moment of going to a funeral for a child. Do you have a believing friend, a saint of old, a leader that you've looked up to you that has already met the Lord? This is what the Bible says. We have a different kind of courage. Why? Because when we leave the body, we are home with the Lord. And so we can go to a funeral and cry and weep and grieve and even be in distress, but that person ain't in distress. They are with the Lord. They've left the body. 
They're now just either soul and spirit or soul or spirit. I don't know. It's too smart for me. It's too high. I don't get paid enough to understand all those things. It's, it's, here's the way we can look to eternity and we can look to those that have already passed away with great courage, understanding they've already met the Lord. This changes everything for us. And in fact, this text says that we don't have to grieve like others grieve. If you are not in Christ, if you're atheistic, if you're secular, if you're figuring things out, or even if you have doubts about the supernaturalness to God and our bodies and eternity, can I just tell you, funerals look totally different for you. I've been at funerals with unbelievers, and it's, it's interesting how they process death versus how I'm starting to, as I mature in my faith, process the death. And many people, they go to the funeral and their whole theology is wrecked and they don't even know it. I mean, if we really came from nothing, then what that really means is we are nothing. If we really are, if all humanity is birthed by accident and just a process of accidental evolution, then we are all accidents. We are all nothing. And so what does a funeral even mean? It's just we came from the dirt through a process of math and, and metamorphosis, and all of a sudden now we just go back to the earth for the earth to eat us? I mean, what is going on here? And their theology is wrong, and they know it is wrong because when they look at someone in a coffin, and when you look at someone in a coffin, and you know that person's no longer there. And so you say it, they're gone. I mean, the body is there, but we all know we are more than just the body. And the Bible says it this way, when we leave the body as a believer in Jesus, we immediately are with the Lord. And so because of this, we grieve differently. I mean, I've been, to, I've been to funerals where people just cope really weird when it comes to death because they just don't know what they don't know. And so they'll say all kinds of odd things to try to make themselves feel better, like, well, they're just an angel up above now or they're my guardian angel and I just know that they're looking down and they're on a tailgate just waiting to crack open a Bud Light with me in heaven. I'm pretty sure God canceled Bud Light, by the way, in heaven. I don't think Bud Light makes it. And they just talk about hunting and football and all these little things to just like cope and grieve. We don't have to grieve like that. We don't have to make stuff up. This is what you know if you're in Christ, that a believing saint passes, the body is here, but they're, they're not. And they are immediately with the Lord. And the Bible says that not only the church will rise, we're not only talking about the dead in the church rising, but we're talking about those of us who are alive, alive when Christ returns, rising up to meet the Lord in the clouds. It says this in verse 15. We declare it. It's a word from the Lord that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will not precede those who have fallen asleep. Verse 17. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together in the clouds. We will be caught up together in the clouds. And so this concept of, and this belief in the resurrection, this is why we do Easter. This is why we blow the roof off in this place. Will you join us next week and invite someone that does not yet believe in the resurrection to sit here with you? Because we're going to boldly proclaim like we try to do every week the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because here's the good news. This world is not our home. It's a temporary landing pad. And this is the very closest thing you'll experience to hell if you are in Christ. It only gets better. And if you are not in Christ, this is the very closest thing you'll ever experience to heaven. It only gets worse for you. And come to know Jesus as Savior. Come to embrace the resurrection of Christ. And I'm compelling you towards that today if you're not yet in Christ. And if you are in Christ, will you invite someone to join you so we can team up. You can evangelize them. You can witness to them. You can invite them to church. And I'll preach the gospel to them. And we'll, we'll do this together as we see more of the people in our community come to know Jesus Christ and believe in the resurrection. Will you join us next week for Resurrection Sunday? And then here's the second thing. Are you in the family? Number one, it requires a belief in the resurrection. And number two, it requires belief in prophecy. It requires belief in prophecy. Can I be honest with you just for a moment? As a younger man, most of my life, 
I've kind of pushed back at and not not wanted to embrace prophecy. And there's a few reasons for that. Number one, some prophecy is scary to me. I mean, I was like a young man and I read through Revelations and I'm like, what was that? I mean, those are, they look like drones with flamethrowers. I read, did I read what I just read? Now we have drones and it makes a little more sense to me. And so there's been some prophecy that I've kind of been like, oh, I'm a little hesitant to embrace. And there's also been many people that have claimed to be prophesying, but they just proclaim gibberish and it's not helpful and it's non-biblical. So there's a lot of people that have distorted that word. And so as a younger man, I've kind of like pushed back at prophecy, but the longer I've been reading prophecy in the Bible, not just someone's opinion, but what God's word says, What I've seen in my life is more encouragement and more faith and a a stronger understanding of God in the future. And so today we are starting what we will begin for several months at our church, reading through scripture, scriptural prophecy, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, and then we're going to head right into Revelations for half of the year, where we read what God says and what God prophesies about the truth. And here's the thing about God's prophecy, it always comes true. Some people have prophesied things that did not come true. And we are to test that and go that we got some problems here. But what God says happens. You got to catch this. In the Old Testament, 300 times there were prophecies about the coming of Jesus Christ in Bethlehem. 300 prophecies of the first coming of Christ. I want to read some of them to you. All of them were fulfilled. It says this in Psalms 78, 1 through 2 that Jesus would teach in parables. The Messiah would come to teach in parables, and he did, many parables. Matthew 13 is an example. There was another prophecy in Zechariah 9 that says he would enter Jerusalem riding a donkey. What an odd prophecy that was fulfilled in Matthew 21. Isaiah 7, he would be called Emmanuel. Isaiah 50, he would be spat upon. Matthew 27, during the crucifixion, he was spat upon. Our Savior was spat upon. And much worse, Isaiah 53. He would be silent before his accusers because he was the Lamb of God, Matthew 27. Psalms 22, his hands and his feet would be pierced. Hundreds and hundreds of years before the Romans even invented what we now know as crucifixion, where feet and hands would be nailed to a cross, it was prophesied that his hands and his feet would be pierced. Little did we know it would be to a Roman cross, Romans 22. Psalms 22, he would be stripped of his clothing. Jesus Christ hung on a cross naked for you. My worst dreams are when I wake up and I'm not wearing my shirt and I'm preaching on a Sunday morning. That's my worst fear, my worst dream. Jesus Christ was naked before the world as he gave his life for you. Isaiah 53 prophesied that he'd be buried in a wealthy man's tomb. And what an odd thing to prophesy it would happen. A wealthy man would take the body of Christ and put it in his own tomb. And not only these, we're talking 300 prophecies of the first coming of Christ, all fulfilled at Jesus in Jerusalem with his disciples. And some of them are multiplied and very complex. For example, the Old Testament says that Jesus would be from Nineveh, but it also says he'd be from Bethlehem. And it also says he would grow up in another country called Egypt. How does someone come from Nineveh, Bethlehem, and Egypt. Well, Jesus was born in Nazareth, conceived in Nazareth, but then a Roman census meant his family had to pay taxes in Bethlehem, and so he would travel to Bethlehem where he'd be born, and then a king wanting to murder him would drive him by the work of an angel to another country called Egypt. And so Jesus would actually grow up in an Egyptian culture to fulfill the multiplied prophecies of the Old Testament. I am flawed as I speak. I just misspoke a word about 30 seconds ago. Jesus is never flawed. God's word is never flawed. God's word is never flawed. Every prophecy comes true. And so this is what's wild about the season that we're entering as a church. There are 300 prophecies of the first coming of Christ. There are 1,845 prophecies about the second coming of Christ. Six times the prophecies about the return of Jesus in the clouds. And so as a church, I want to encourage you to lean into prophecy as it encourages us and it grows our faith 
and we grow in anticipation of the return of our Lord and Savior. Today, let's look to six of the prophecies we see in our text today. Six end-time prophecies from our passage, things that will come true. Number one, we see the descent of Christ. The Bible says that the Lord himself will descend. We're talking a second coming. He already descended in a, in a manger in Bethlehem, but he will descend again. And in fact, when he left earth, the angel said this about him, men of Galilee, why are you looking into heaven? This Jesus, who is just taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. He would head up towards the clouds, and many, many years later, he will return in the clouds. We see the prophecy of the descending Christ. Number two, here's another end time prophecy. Not only will we see Christ descend, number two, we will hear a commanding cry. We will hear a commanding cry. I have no idea what that's going to sound like, but I have a feeling I'll know it as soon as I hear it. We'll hear three things in a row. Number one, a commanding cry. And then number two, we'll hear an archangel's voice. There's only one archangel in the Bible. His name is Michael. And Michael the archangel, or another archangel possibly, will vocally speak across the earth. And so we will see the Lord descending in the air. We'll hear a commanding cry. And then we'll hear the voice of an angel. And then we'll hear a third sound, back to back, three sounds. We'll hear the trumpet of God. The trumpet of God. These are things that will happen in the la- on the last day, in the last moments, the Lord descending, the command of God, the archangel's voice, and then the very trumpet of God. And this trumpet is so special because it alters our entire being. It alters everything we know. 1 Corinthians 15 says this about the trumpet. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, Revelations teaches us that there are seven trumpets. It's not the first one. It's not the third, fourth, fifth, sixth. It's the seventh trumpet. At the seventh trumpet, the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. When you hear that trumpet sound, everything is altered for you. Verse 53 says this, for this perishable body, your flesh, your skin, the, bo- the v- vehicle that you drive in, your body, must put on the imperishable, and the mortal body must put on immortality. We have an issue with our bodies today. I I don't know if you're on the older side, but there's something that happens around 39. Your body just doesn't work the way it used to work. Can I get an amen? Man, what's, what's happened? Last year it happened. Just like, I move slower, things heal slower, I don't feel the same. I don't got the energy that I used to have. As you progressively get older, you realize that your body, my body, is perishable. It doesn't last forever. Now, our bodies were designed to last forever. Adam and Eve in the garden had bodies that were immortal. They were supposed to last for eternity. But sin entered our world, and so now... Though our body can heal itself and regenerate and even our blood can glue our skin back together and even our, even the viruses inside of us can be fought by our own body, there's still some limitations to us. Because of sin, we no longer live forever. And so things start aching more and creaking more and all kinds of weird noises from our body that we never expected to hear. All kinds of things are taking place and it's just not right. And we know it's not right. And so it's discouraging and it's deflating and then we get one win because our, our right foot stops hurting so much and then my back went out, just like that. Why is that? Well, because we are in a fallen world and our bodies are deteriorating before us, some of us faster than others. But this is what will happen when God sounds the trumpet, you change, I change. And so for the dead, whose bodies are just in the dust of the ground, most of them are deteriorate, deteriorated away. That dust will be raised and miraculously made into new perfected human bodies and your body will be completely altered. Immortality will become mortality. There will be a massive flip. 
there'll be a massive flip. The trump, the trumpet of God changes everything. And here we see the fifth prophecy, number five. Not only the trumpet of God, but number five, the gathered church. We are promised, and it is prophesied by God, not by someone else, by God, that the church will be gathered together in one moment, in one place. It says this in verse 17, Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds. The word there you could use is raptured up together. Then we who are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. My job is to say words. That's predominantly what I get paid to do, to say things. I pray quietly sometimes, but most of the time I'm saying things to you. That's what I get paid for. And these are, these are un, I don't have the words to describe what this verse is going to look like. All we can do is imagine for a moment this verse unfolding. The Bible says that we will be caught up in the air. How do I describe that? Some of you have gone skydiving before because you're crazy. This is the opposite. I mean, we've all, we know how to fall. We're good, we're good at falling. We're good at dropping. There's this gravitational pull. It always sends us right back. Some of you, you wake up every morning and things just drop. I mean, you're good at dropping. But what God does is everything different here because he brings us up. We are skydiving in reverse. We are flying to meet the Lord. Can you imagine that feeling? I mean, as you're soaring through the air, it won't be instantaneous. There's some level of time here. Is it 10 seconds? Is it 60 seconds? How many people will you wave to? You are flying in the air. This is prophesied by God. How do you describe that? How do you describe the gathering all saints together in one place. One of, the, one of the most heart-wrenching conversations I have is with a pastor that says, will you help me? Our church is empty. Very few people are left. It's just a few of us old people left. We want to see the next generation lead in this church and everyone's left. Can you help? Those are the hardest conversations when the saints all leave the room. And I am so fortified and encouraged. I get like these, I get like goosebumps up my back when I walk into this room and I hear all of you worshiping Jesus at the same time. A couple months ago, you can clap for that. A couple months ago, our 20s ministry, my wife and I took our 20s ministry to Louisville where we gathered for cross conference and when we were there, I didn't realize how many young people would be in the room. I mean, I knew that it was like sold out or whatever. But when we walked in to the conference center, there were 10,000 young adults worshiping Jesus. And when you see that many people, it just like, it kind of messes with your mind. There's just like people upon people and you're just looking at the rows and they just keep going. 10,000 saints. I've seen that with my eyes. All the saints of world history in the clouds at the same time. What will that feel like when you see every believer that's already, that's already passed before you, when you see every spouse that you were so sad to say goodbye to, when you see them all gathered in one place, the lady that witnessed to you, the pastor that preached the gospel to you, the pastor you never met that preached on the radio that you heard that sermon from, the author of a song that changed your life, all of us gathered in one place, it is prophesied, we will see them in the clouds, it's called a family reunion, are you going to that family reunion? Number six. The Lord's presence. I saved the best for last. It's the last one on the list. That's the last one in our text. The Bible says, then we will meet the Lord. And not only that, but we will always be with the Lord and that meeting changes everything for us in a different way. You see, the trumpet changes us physically. But seeing the very face of God will change us spiritually for all of eternity. Scripture says this in 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now. Are you God's child? Because this verse doesn't apply to you if you're just going with the flow. Are you in the family? If you're God's child now, 
then what we will be has not yet appeared. We know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. In one moment, we will be like Jesus, totally purified, all together at the very same time. Imagine that. Listen, some of you, it, it irritates you to even come into church because you've got this nagging thing in the back of your head, I'm really messed up on Wednesday. Or if you could go back to 2007 or 1987, you'd be drastically disappointed in this man and this woman. And some of you have these thoughts going through your head like, I can't even sing to God, and I'm so glad that the band's doing the singing, but I'm just going to sit here quietly because those words should not be uttered out of this mouth. If you knew the things that I've said, if you knew the hand's the, the hand that's raised right now, you would know I should probably put my hand down because of all the things that that hand has done, all the things it's taken, all the things it's abused, all of that. And you feel this like, this itch, this irritation to even gather with God's people because you feel lesser than, and on some level you are. But we're all the same. And when we meet the Lord, he purifies us in a moment and that is gone forever. No more guilt no more shame because when we see him, we will be like him. What a glorious day. What a glorious day. And so I want to encourage you, if you are not in the family, to respond by joining the family. Romans 6 says this, We were buried therefore with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life Do you know you need a new chapter? Do you know it's time to start walking with the Lord? Then we believe in the death of Jesus Christ and we embrace the things he's asked us to do and one of the things he's asked us to do is baptism. It says this in Romans 6, 5. There's a symbol of baptism. It says this, for if we have been united with him in death like this, we shall certainly be united in him in a resurrection like this. And two weeks from today, we're going to have baptisms right here in this auditorium. And there's a symbol that's modeled through baptism. We believe in submersion baptism because that's how Jesus was baptized and all the saints were baptized in the Bible. They went down into the water. That symbolized many things. One of the things that symbolizes Jesus went in the grave. And you and I will all die one day unless if the Lord returns and we will go into the grave. It also symbolizes that we are spiritually dead. It also symbolizes that we're on a dead planet. I mean, things are changing here. It's not good here. But God takes us from death and brings us to life spiritually and he will lead us off of this planet or he will pull us out of the grave. And the symbol of baptism is the symbol of resurrection. And so if you've given your life to Christ, if you've given your life to Jesus recently, would you, promote, would you acknowledge that to your church family by publicly saying, I need to be baptized, I need to follow Jesus and that's in two weeks from today. And so if you're not yet in Christ, what I would ask you to do is receive Christ today and take that step of baptism. And today you can join the very family of God that is gathered here today. We're an imperfect family. We're, po- we're full of a bunch of hypocrites. We're not well-spoken. We make mistakes. We're flawed, but we have something special, a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Do you have that? If you do not, would you join the family This is the simple gospel. It's up on the screen. It says this in Romans 3.10. None is righteous. No, not one. Eric, I'm a pretty good person. I mean, I don't do really bad things. Well, no, the Bible disagrees with you. None is righteous. No, not one. You can push your survey to the side. 100%, all, absolutely everyone, is not righteous before the Lord. That's the beginning of your understanding of the gospel. Romans 5.8 says this, but God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You see, there's this distortion in our head. Like, I want to go to heaven. I want to be a good person. And so I'm messed up and jacked up right now. But what I'll do is I'll slowly, progressively get a little bit better and then God will approve of me. And that is not the gospel at all. You see, the gospel says that when you're a sinner, when you are unrighteous, That's when God, out of his sheer love for you, commits his death on the cross for your soul. Jesus died for you while you were a sinner. And then Romans 10, 9 says this, if you confess with your mouth that that Jesus is Lord 
and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. I think this is the clearest text of what it means to be a Christian. There's this verbal decision with your mouth, and there's also this faith within your heart. You can't just have something in your heart and then be so, so like, have no courage to declare it with your mouth. A prayer is necessary for a decision in your heart and vice versa. You can't just say things with your mouth and just say whatever your wife or your husband wants you to say without believing that decision within your heart. It's a twofold decision. It's a decision with my mouth and it's a decision in my heart. And if you confess the Lord, you can be saved. And then Ephesians 2.8 says this, For by grace you've been saved through faith. Jesus Christ came to earth. You don't deserve it, I don't deserve it, but God showed us his love by the grace that is displayed with Jesus on a cross and he went into a grave and then he conquered and defeated death. Death has no more claim because Jesus has stolen that claim from the enemy and for by grace you are saved and then we do this. Here it is, through faith. And it's not our own doing, it's a gift of God. Even our faith is not our own doing. God gives that to us. The Holy Spirit convicts us. He empowers us to receive Jesus. Have you put your faith in Jesus? Do you believe the gospel? If these verses are ringing true with you and you want to receive Christ today, then what I want to encourage you to do in about two minutes is pray this prayer. And it's just some simple words from these verses that says this, God, would you forgive me of my sin? When Jesus preached his first message, he said, repent, turn around from your sin. John the Baptist said, I got a message, repent, turn from your sin. Not let's feel good about ourselves and just, and just like acknowledge everyone's all right. No, 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 that's not what the Bible says at all. The Bible says we're not all right. It's bad. And so I need to acknowledge the fact that I've sinned and God, would you forgive me of my sin? I want to turn from it and turn to a savior. Number two, I believe you died for me. But not only that, we believe in the resurrection I believe you rose for me. Lord, I am placing my faith in Christ today. I'm going to give you a chance to repeat this prayer with me and even from your seat to pray out loud, God, I want to receive you as Savior. And you can join the three individuals in our church that have done this today and the hundreds in this room that have done this before. Raise your hand if you've already received Christ as Savior, if that is you. If you have not yet received Christ as Savior, will you join the family and pray this prayer with me right now? You can say it out loud if you're so bold, please. God, would you forgive me of my sins? I believe you died for me. I believe you rose for me. I'm placing all my faith in Christ today. If that was you just a moment ago and you prayed that prayer, the Bible says that, the, that, the, that, the, that heaven rejoices and we want to rejoice too. And so would you let your church family know right now that you pray this prayer by raising your hand? If that was you and you in this room just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior, would you raise your hand so we could rejoice with you? If you pray that prayer, I just want to say welcome to the family. And if you're one of the hundred or so that's joining us online today, we want to say welcome to the family, but we can't see you. The government can see you, we can't see you. <laughs> so we want to encourage you to join us at church, come and meet with us, talk to us about what it means to be baptized, even if it's a long drive for you. And if you were in this room this morning and received Christ, can I have you join my wife and I right over here, right after the closing song today? We want to pray with you and then talk to you about the next steps in your faith. If you've prayed that prayer, welcome to the family. Let's close in worship and pray together. God, we want to thank you for this Sunday. We want to thank you that you've brought dead things to life. God, I think even in this room right now, there have been some that have received Christ. God, what an awesome miracle to witness on a Sunday morning. God, thank you for the three young men that made a decision today to give their life to Christ at the 9 o'clock service. God, thank you for the other young man who wants to be baptized and the family that wants to be baptized together. God, what an awesome thing to come to a church and see you stirring hearts 
by the power of the Holy Spirit and bringing new souls to the family. God, for anyone that's still wrestling, would you help them to tap out? They know the religion they formed in their head is bogus. The Holy Spirit is starting to reveal that to them. What would you help them to tap out? Would you help them to give in? The Lord will return and many are not ready, maybe even some still in this room. Lord, would you help us to be ready? God, thank you for the family. We're an odd family. We don't even like each other sometimes, but you've brought us together. And Lord, collectively with one voice, we now sing what we declare as truth. It's from the scripture. We believe it, Lord. And now we sing it to you. Jesus Christ, amen. I cast my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me. I see his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on the cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in joy. By heavy stone, Messiah still and all alone. Oh, praise the name of the Lord our God. Oh, praise His name forevermore. For
Amen. What better way to kick off your Sunday morning, right? Praise the Lord our God. Amen. So as we approach Easter Sunday, which by the way, we can celebrate every day that God gives us breath, right? And be thankful for his resurrection. Not just a story in the Bible, but we truly believe that and we show that in our daily walk, at work, at church, in our homes. Do we truly believe God sent his son to die and raise him up again from the dead. I do. I know a lot of you do. And we're going to blow the roof off this place like Pastor Eric said next Sunday in celebration of that. But as you leave this building and you got to ask yourself, am I a brother or a sister or am I another, an other, right? And if you're questioning that, I might be an other I would plead with you, please come forward. We're gonna have families up here in a minute to pray with you, talk with you, and what that looks like. But we also wanna rejoice in the fact that there has been a few individuals that have given their life to the Lord today. Can we say amen to that? Praise God. Yeah, amen. Harvest, you are loved, you're dismissed.